digital equity and technological inclusion in online courses to support student success. My name is Dr. Wanda White and I am from Winston-Salem State University where I am the director of the Center for Innovative and Transformative Instruction. This presentation will share information on ways that educators in higher ed can ensure that online courses are equitable, inclusive, and accessible to students relevant to technology access, tool availability, and online content interaction. Upon completion of this webinar, participants, participants will be able to recognize how a digital divide for students can create problems for academic success, understand ways to include resources and options for students who have digital limitations. Before I begin, I have a scenario I would like for you to consider. Meet Jeff. Jeff, a junior at the University of XYZ, has suddenly been shifted to 100% online instruction due to COVID-19. Here's a little background on Jeff. He has always been a very diligent student who never made less than an A in his courses. Jeff lives on campus and rarely went home on weekends. Jeff also works at the grocery store near campus to earn extra money to help support himself so his parents would not have to send him money. He has three younger siblings at home in grades 11th, 7th, and 5th. With four students in a house, it is usually very busy and noisy. Whenever Jeff goes home for breaks or holidays and needs to do his assignments for his courses, he would always go to the public library to complete them and submit them into Canvas. Jeff was saving up to buy his own laptop and computer. His parents have a computer at home, but his siblings use this one too. Now Jeff is back at home. He has 15 hours of coursework that needs to be completed successfully online. He has never taken an online course before now. He is a fast learner, but his biggest concern is how he will be able to access his courses at home. With three other students there who also have to complete assignments online and only one laptop between the four of them, they will need to schedule time for each. One more thing, Jeff lives in an area where high-speed internet access is not available. Their internet is slow. So in the past, when Jeff needed to complete an assignment when, home, when at home, he would walk up to the public library or go to his community center to access their internet. Both are closed now due to COVID. Jeff is very worried about how he can maintain his great GPA and continue to do well in college. Jeff is a student who has digital access limitations. When we design our online courses, we have to think about Jeff and his situation. I will refer to Jeff often in my presentation. It is no doubt that we are a society that depends on digital devices. Students can use digital devices as well. However, many students don't have access to the technology that they know how to use. Many depend on campus facilities such as the computer lab, library, or, or other workspaces. What does the research say about the digital divide? Well, there is a digital divide in higher ed. The digital divide refers to the perceived gap between those who have access to the latest information technologies and those who do not. One study suggests that the digital divide between information haves and have nots along racial and socioeconomic lines seem to widen as time passes. To address those issues of digital equity and technology inclusion, Educational leaders are in positions to ensure equitable digital opportunities are made available for students to help bridge the digital divide. Other research suggests that the digital divide focused on the limited access to the internet in inner cities and rural areas. More recent indi research indicated that the issues of access decreased with the inclusion of smart and mobile devices. However, this issue 
for purposes to complete assignments and online courses continue to rise at a critical level. For that reason, it has been shown that 37% of college students who use their smartphones for online and hybrid access, they use them to view lectures, access assignments, submit assignments, and some even to take quizzes and tests. Technology quick facts. Did you know that white students and Asian students have better access than black students and Hispanic students and even Native American students? In 2015, two of the main reasons students lacked access to the internet at home were that access was either too expensive or their family felt that there was no need or had no interest in having the internet. Now, it is really great right now that some of the major internet vendors are offering free access to qualified households currently. I hope that they continue that. Internet access can be expensive for some families. It's considered a luxury. And a lot of times parents who are from low income or parents who have low incomes and children of parents who do not have high levels of educational attainment they may not feel the need that students have to have the internet at home. A significant number of students who are first-generation students or receive the Pell Grant oftentimes do not purchase their laptops until their junior or senior years because they are sometimes using their funds their first two years for books, other supplies, and other needs as first-generation students. Traditional classes, it's really easy for us to see a need of a student when they come into our classroom. We can assess the situation and say, hmm, he doesn't have a laptop, or hmm, she seems to be taking tests on her phone. So in a traditional class, educators make a conscious effort to address all aspects of equity, accessibility, and inclusion for students. But when students are online, we can't see what they have. We can't see what they're using. And it makes it very difficult to know who have the digital limitations. Here are some things we need to consider. When students leave our campus, a space where they have access to labs, libraries, with lots of technology, where do they get to use technology in their communities. Also, when instruction shifts to 100% online, whether by emergency, as it did last spring, or by choice, if you choose to teach online, what can we do instructionally to make sure that lack of technology access does not ruin the academic success of a student? There's a fine line between failure and success oftentimes with online classes. Some of these factors that we need to monitor, can they maintain their grades if they have a digital limitation? Can they complete the course if they have a digital limitation? Or even will they return back to us next semester if they have a digital limitation? How do we ensure every student who is enrolled in the course has the needed technology and tools and access that are required to be successful in an online course? Well, the first three in blue are some great ways that a lot of our universities did this past spring. Many of you provided laptops, supplied hotspots to students, and even sought corporate sponsorship to help support the need of students who had the digital limitations. All of those required money and funding. Here are some ways that are simple and don't really require a lot of money. First of all, we can communicate to our students technology requirements early. Now, of course, March 2020 was an emergency. However, going forward, we should communicate to students what they need digitally to be successful in courses that are online and hybrid. Here's the best one. Instructional methodology. 
how we teach our course, how we build our course can help support students with digital limitations in an online class. So let's look at some of these solutions and ways that we can support those types of students. Again, I mentioned earlier, university technology requirements. Every university should establish a university universal technology requirement statement. Also, they should remain consistent with those technology requirements that are given by the university, meaning avoid adding on needed software or tech tools that students may have to purchase for individual courses. Back to the instructional methodology, how we design our course is key. Despite the growth in the number of online programs, it is known that little support is provided for faculty on how to teach in an online environment. Many faculty this past spring were thrust online to teach, some with little to no training. While most assume that the knowledge and skills required to teach in a traditional classroom are readily translatable to online teaching, we all know that there is a significant difference. It's not the same, different pedagogies. So with that in mind, here are some questions I have to ask you, and you can answer those in the chat or just in your mind. A lot of times when we are designing a course, we need to understand that there are difference, differences in the words and language that we use for students to understand what is expected of them in an online course. So here are some questions. The following items, and by the way, they're true or false, the following items are the same, learning activity, assignment, and assessment. True or false? Number two, for an online course, it is always important for the student to see the instructor. What that means is they need to be able to, in real time, Zoom with you or on Big Blue Button or Skype at 1 o'clock to 1.50, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. True or false? And number three, in an online setting, students are not independent enough to follow learning modules without a full lecture. True or false? All three were false. Now, there are some key important reasons that we should find a balance using asynchronous and synchronous lessons in our online classes. We know that synchronous learning means it happens in real time. Zoom, Skype, Big Blue Button, or other video formats that you may choose. And then, of course, asynchronous means that it is not real time and students can access that information at another time, such as modules, discussion boards, pre-recorded videos, collaborative chats, etc. Asynchronous assignments do assist with digital limitations. Why? Let's think about Jeff. Remember Jeff had limited access to his laptop in his parents' house. There are four other students, excuse me, four people have to use that same laptop. Jeff also has a part-time job that he gets his schedule for. So if he can access his coursework at any time during the week, that's going to make his success better. Asynchronous lessons allow students to go to other sites to complete their assignment. Think about Jeff again. Let's say the fifth grader or the seventh grader, his siblings are on the laptop. Jeff can go to his relative's house or those other two options that he usually does when they use the laptop. Asynchronous lessons allow the professor to create learning modules, which puts all of the requirements for the week or unit in one place, making instruction and assignments organized, systematic, and quicker to locate. There is a lot of, there are a lot of studies out there on 
the effectiveness of learning modules in online classes relevant to student success. So all of these reasons make asynchronous very key in helping students with digital limitations. What about the actual assignments that we give? Did you know that how we ask a student to complete an assignment can present digital limitations? Let's just talk about a few ways. How many of us have said you can only submit your assignment as a Word document or as a particular document, PDF, or any other kind of document? What if that student does not have access to that program? I was guilty of that as a writing faculty member. I wanted my students to submit as a Word document. And it was semesters later that students came to me and said, when I'm not on campus, I don't have access to Word. Here's another one. There's a movie that you need to watch, downloaded in Canvas. Did you know that some movie downloads or even asking students to access Netflix can require high-speed internet access or even money? Inconsistency in due dates. Each week assignments are due at a different date. Now, I know it is very convenient for us to make our due dates and assignment dates convenient to what works for us as faculty members. But think about the consistency if a student knows that my faculty member, my professor, posts on Sunday night and everything is due on Friday night. They know those dates. The last one, you will need to purchase and you can fill in the blank with a novel, software, tech tool, any other kind of digital access to complete this week's assignment. We just gave a student one week notice to go out and buy something. No matter how little an amount may be to us, $29.99 may be too much for some students who just don't have it. Now let's talk about how we assess students and how the digital limitations can present themselves there. Many students access their classes using their smartphones. We learned that earlier. One out of three students, 37%. Objective assessments where faculty are worried about academic honesty are difficult to take on a smartphone because of the lockdown browsers like Respondus. Of course, we want to prevent students from cheating, but when you put lockdown browsers on your objective tests, some students, 37%, may not be able to access it and take that test. So using more formative assessments that are subjective not only reduces the stress of how a student can take a proctored test online, it also reduces that concern you have about cheating. Subjective assessments are more difficult to find answers like objective assessments. They can't look them up. Textbook requirements can present a digital limitation. It's no secret students opt to not buy textbooks in traditional classes. Well, if it's an online class, it's probably even more likely that they are not going to purchase the textbook. Is that a problem? Yes. But is it also a limitation? Can be. If we can find publishers that offer ebooks as textbooks, that will help a lot of students. Ebooks are typically less costly than the hard copy textbooks. The other good thing about online is you can find resources sometimes that the textbooks have in them. You can link them to external sources that are free. And my colleagues in the next presentation are going to share how to do that. Here's something that I call the semantics of assumptions or even insensitivity. These are assumptions that we may say that could have technology barriers for students. How many of us have ever said, you must have your camera on when we Zoom or when we Skype? What if they are accessing your Zoom by phone because they don't have a laptop or maybe their laptop is older and doesn't have a webcam or maybe the webcam is broken? What if their living situation is not one that they want seen on camera? 
Think about it. It can be something as simple with three other students in the class in the house like Jeff, and there's no home office. So maybe the living room where the desktop is located is very busy. Now, the, the virtual backgrounds help a lot. So if students who don't know about virtual backgrounds, they can use those. Changing the synchronous meeting time each week to fit your schedule. That again, that helps our schedule. If we have a hair appointment or we need to go pick up groceries or to go to the cleaners and our class, if it's online, a synchronous session is at one and we really want to schedule that appointment at one. Sure, it's easy to change that time for students, but is it really easy for the student to then change their schedule? Think about Jeff. He has a lot of parameters around when he gets to use his laptop. So these are not good. As I start to wrap up, here are some simple ways to support students who have tech limitations. Use asynchronous lessons as much as possible. Of course, again, balance is key and you will know your students best. <clears throat> Include formative assessments when you can rather than the large midterms and finals that can sometimes be objective formats and need online proctoring. Communicate technology needs early and avoid requesting tools or software beyond what your university requires. And allow students to sub submit assignments in multiple formats, not restricting them to just one particular format that may fit us. Asynchronous is always great. Weekly assignments work best in online pedagogy. Many studies have shown that if a student has almost an entire week to complete assignments, they are more apt to complete it. Big box online university universities live by this because most of their students are working adults. Set times and dates that you post assignments and due dates. Make it consistent because remember, if you're not consistent, our students won't either, won't be either, and that affects student success. Create an alternative course plan that takes into consideration there are students with digital limitations. That requires flexibility. And yes, it does require a little bit more work on our part, a little bit more planning, um, extra time that we have to put in. But the student success in your class with not a lot of DFWs, and having students complete it successfully will be worth it. Identify digital and technology tools that are available for students from the university and other places that are free and put them in your syllabus and in your course. Advocate for a campus-wide orientation or inventory that students must take that will identify any digital limitations that they may have and you can help support them or they can find support on campus. Encourage your students to be open and upfront with you about the online course and their needs throughout the course. The more you know about their limitations, the more you can help accommodate and bridge that gap. This may mean giving an early survey in the course the first week, or it could be first week discussion board where you encourage your students to talk about their limitations or their access. The more we can dialogue with students about digital equity and technology limitations, the more solutions we can find to support them. We can begin to build partnerships with technology corporations who would like to invest in closing the gaps in digital equity and inclusion. Here's what I know about the future. It happens as a result of what we do today. Thank you, and I will take any questions that you may have.